We have to remember the Indonesian army's experience prior to this of dealing with the UN was what? It was Papua. In Papua, they had successfully completely falsified, totally manipulated a UN process. And far from being criticized for it, far from getting any return or any serious reaction against that, they all went along with it. In fact, they started to enthusiastically support it. And to this day, Papua is stuck with a supposedly legitimate integration into Indonesia, which everybody knows, including all the UN people know, was completely illegitimate, completely false. I spoke to Benny Wender just the other day. His father was one of those chiefs brought together to vote. And he said, the UN, the, uh, UN and the Indonesians had said before the vote, they said, well, what we're going to do now, you're going to get together in this big space here. And, and, and when we say, Papua, you raise your hands. So it sounded like a perfectly reasonable thing if you were Papua. Yes, I'm Papua. Papua, they said, oh, raise hands. Okay, that's it. They voted to join. That was it. Now, this is not a mystery. Everybody knows this. The UN people know it. Everybody knows it. They know it to this day. So that's what the Indonesian army knew about this. That's what their experience was. And the Timorese people's experience was, like my friend. So, do we know what the plan was? I don't think I know, and I'm not sure if anybody else does. So what could have happened, what might have happened, what was in the thoughts of the people there, and you saw several different ones. You, know, you saw those who just didn't want to say who it was because they, of course, had a pretty good idea who it was, but they didn't want to be naming anybody in case that was their death knell. You know? And there were others who were saying, yeah, no, no, it's okay, we won, that's it, we've done it now, we're sorted. And there were others who were going to fight with a sort of spear against a machine gun. And so on. each person, each character, each group has its own scenario. And of course, when you make a film, you have to choose to some extent a scenario. And usually you inform yourself, you do research, you try to understand, <clears throat> tell people what happened. But that doesn't actually explain what happened for the people who were part of it. It doesn't, it's not a faithful record of what happened. And that's one reason why I think you would find that people from inside a situation like that are often silent, somewhat bemused by the accounts of it that are told afterwards or elsewhere. They don't have to be in, in, inaccurate, they just don't tell it the way they experienced it. And this is a tricky issue. So I, this is a, an attempt, just a, an attempt to do that in, in some way. Uh, now, I did put together, I don't know if we have time for that, so you, you must tell me, but I did put together a couple, of, uh, a little theme, which was to indicate some of the more conventional news stories. I put in a program I call this anti-news, because it, 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 it was not new, it was not un it was everybody's version of events competing without any clear conclusion except in the end that suddenly the, the forces actually did arrive. And for me that was the moment when independence seemed likely. I just come from Yugoslavia, so Srebrenica was in my mind when I, when I was there. And I could, you know, go into the, what the journalists were saying, not saying and so forth, and many of them were saying when I said I wasn't going to go, they, they, they looked at me and they said, well, how are you going to get out of here? But of course, I didn't know the answer to that. But that was the sort of, you know, there were these, these, these events are sort of left behind once what happened, happened. And in the archive, what we try to do um, is to document many different aspects of the birth of the nation of Timor-Leste. We have 4,000 hours on Timor-Leste at the moment. We don't 
know entirely what the story will be. We don't do what we normally are asked to do if we're trying to fund a movie. Tell people what the movie is. Uh, what we do is we un try to understand what the, the themes of significance are. And they don't necessarily, they're not all political necessarily, they could be cultural, they could be sporting, they could be all sorts. Things which seem to have important aspects of the ongoing story embedded in them. And then those stories, you, you try to follow them. There are many different stories. And when you get an opportunity, when there's a moment, when there's an audience, then you make a film. You make it for the local people, whether it's an anniversary or it could be uh, uh, an issue, or for foreigners who may come. Foreigners do come, even now, obviously not like they did before, and ten, tends to be the same kind of stuff, of course, that you need to talk to because people's interest is fairly superficial. But that ongoing process of trying to document the birth of a nation, which is the broad task that we have set ourselves in the archive, goes back, of course, partly you're looking research into the materials that we have from before and materials we can find from before. And it also goes forward. We're looking to see what is the key issue here, what's developing, and things develop which you don't expect. And you try to understand or try to keep a, a material that is relevant to what's important. And if you've done that right, when there's an audience, it could be because of a news story, it could be because of an occasion or a local occasion or a, uh, an anniversary or whatever, then you will produce a film for that or a, a, an edit for that or a selection for that. If it's for local people, very local people, they don't really want your edit, to be quite frank. They will just look at the, as much of the old, unedited material as possible. Uh, and, and of course, that's the other side of it. You try to involve other authors in making films. So local people, we work, all the people at the centre except me, occasionally we get uh, money to hire somebody else, or we find a way to work with somebody else uh, from outside. But we're working with the team Reeves, and I, you know, we do, they do a lot of stuff going to the mountains or in the communities and showing material and getting from that material more information that they might then go back and we might then develop and so on. It's a constant process. And um, outsiders also are engaged in this. I made a, you know, a list. We have a distinguished filmmakers here present who have used some of our material uh, here for the New Zealand audience and others. But we have filmmakers from all over the place, Canada, the United States, Europe, France, England, Portugal, etc. And we work with them. We, we don't, you know, obviously, we do it the way that people do with archives, but we are creatively involved. And, and for those who are interested, I bought one or two little films here, which, which are the result of this kind of process of cooperation, should people want afterwards. Uh, to, to take them. But we ourselves also look back at things. So I've done a lot of work on, for example, the Santa Cruz Massacre. And this is part of a process which has become part of the founding memory of Timor Leste. This is a key issue. It's a sad irony, in my view, that the very countries that most need a story, a real story, not an inventive story, but a founding story are the very countries that don't have it. They don't have access to it. They're split and fragmented by different stories. Every community has a story, of course, many stories. So they can be tension. They can create a lot of tension. We had a crisis in Timor, 2006. It was all about that. It was all about stories. Different communities with different stories, not trusting each other to share in their common story. It really created a disaster. Hundreds of thousands of people fled. And it lasted for years. But 
we play a part, and during that process, the leaders of Timor Leste, who are not, who are not unaware of this, very, very aware of this, the current president, I happened to be in the building. He, we were, our building then was where we were, it was then taken over by the head of the army and police operation that was sent at the end of this to look for the rebels in the hills. And this guy, the commander, said to me, look, you've got to, I want you to go and show films to the people in these communities, particularly the communities that were involved in this crisis, because they share a story. And that shared story is the foundation of stability, the foundation of an identity. And without an identity, you don't have a democracy. You don't have a shared community. You don't have a nation. So we are part of that process, but we are obviously aware that part of it is myth-making. Part of it is not myth-making, and we certainly don't believe in inventing false myths, if you like. But every story every, has this myth, mythical aspect. Indeed, most fiction films are based on that. If they don't have that mythical dimension, that part of it that makes the story more than the details that it contains, it's not going to be made. And amongst the many different stories that we have been a part of for international consumption, for different communities, whether they're Brazil, uh, we're working with the Brazilians right now, for example, uh, or Australia, New Zealand, etc., are stories which have now become on a scale where Hollywood is now involved. We now, I just came from Timor and, and I was approached there by a producer who has the money apparently to make a film. This is a fiction film based upon a documentary film which we worked with some American filmmakers called Alias Ruby Blade about Kirsty Sword who married Janana was now the Really leader. Kirsty was with us in the first film that I made it to. So, this is a big story, a big subject, and I have really prepared lots of different thoughts and possibilities on it, but I think it's important to yeah, give time to the conversation. You have time to, sh to show some things. Yeah. Just, just before that, there's one thing I think you yes. left out of this narrative, Max, and that is your own role. <laughs> and, and to me, it perhaps needs to be said that terrible time just after the referendum when, when Dilly was in flames and APEC was happening in Auckland. There was one and one only journalist, Western journalist, still left in East Timor, and that was you. And you actually left out also that you did have a way of communicating with the outside world. Because one of my, you know, I was following the issue extremely closely at the time I was engaged with the um, organising things around APEC. And one of the things I remember most clearly, in fact, I probably even had recorded it somewhere, was an interview on our radio in New Zealand with Kim Hill, pretty sure it was Kim Hill, and you were in the mountains talking low, in a low voice, um, so as not to be heard by the Indonesians, presumably, but it was so authentic because of the roosters crowing in the background and everything, and it was really spine-chilling, spine-chilling stuff. And, I, you know, you, obviously you can't say that about yourself, but it was an amazing role, and I think it deserves some credit here. Well, thank you. Uh, it, to me, I think the most important thing here is the story itself and the share role that I played in it is a privilege that I feel that I wish to give back. Well, um, the others have all gone away on a plane. You're the only one in the invisible. But it's a role which is important <laughs> as part of the nation building process, and that's all I was interested in saying here because recently I had cancer in 2012 and I was in the UK being treated and the president who was then Franz Orta went on TV I didn't know about this of course but in Timor he went on TV and he said no, this is Max Stalin this is what's happening and, and uh, please pray mm -hmm. and uh, the result was extraordinary I, I don't know if it was just Jose Horta's intervention, but the, they had made a kind of a totem, if you like, out of me. I became a way, not cynical way, 
you know, totally genuine way, for people to, to remember and to share the story. And I was part of the story, as Ray said. So I became part of that story. But there are many ways in which the government is trying to do that, trying to build that story, to put the sort of Nelson, Nelson on his column in, in, in the consciousness of the people. And I mean, I, I, I wore this, this T-shirt today because this is one of them, you know. Um, and we have here many who could translate this for, for our audience. Yes, well, I, I, I know what it says, but basically it is, it is for a, a, a t-shirt, one of the number that were made uh, in Timor, which the people who were veterans of the day of Santa Cruz wear. And they wear it, especially on the 12th of November every year, when thousands of people every year walk the same road that the massacre, or this massacre in, in the 12th of November. And, uh, you know, if we have time, uh, of course we don't, but if we have time, I could show you that. And you see, it, it doesn't matter that moments of terrible moments, even in the middle of the crisis of 2006, it happened. It, it's, it, there was a time when the young guys, the young people were involved in, in uh, martial arts in, in the middle of that crisis, were fighting each other. On that particular day of the 12th of November, uh, they came, they went around dealing together talking about how it shared the, the uh, sacrifice of that day. When I was filming this crisis, and I, you know, with this film here, there's some images, it was fairly hairy. I was in the middle of people firing rocks at each other and, and so on. In some cases, bullets. But both sides were keen to see me, and I wear this hat, nearly all this old hat like it. So it's like a brand, you know, <laughs> they turn up the others. <laughs> they wanted to, both of them thought they were somehow or other in the tradition of the struggle for independence. Nobody was against it, everybody was for it, except that they didn't agree about exactly how and what. But that made me, I was able to go in the middle of that situation and, and tell people being shot, people being rocky, sorry, rocks, all this way. So that story was a line and was a potential for bringing people together, even in the midst of that division, that terrible crisis where, which, which threatened civil war at a certain point. What do you think of the way the, um, the story is being told through that very expensive National Museum? Well, <laughs> uh, the National Museum, of course, is, is a, is a a part of the National Resistance Museum, and indeed, we have been asked by, by the government to work with them, and they are actually building us a building behind it now. Uh, I say us, I mean, they actually belong to the museum, and we now need to work out how we're going to work with that and all the rest of it, and there are various issues of that sort, but I think the museum, the museum is, I think it's beautiful, and it, it, it on a certain level, it's going to appeal to people to convey and communicate something important. It's one of the ways in which memory is valued and celebrated. Uh, my vision of it is that it shouldn't be the main way or it shouldn't be the only way. It should be the base, if you like, or a base um, that we should try to open up and bring the story to the people, not just wait for the people to come to the museum, because of course the vast majority of Timorese will never go to the museum. They feel intimidated by such a place, even if they could go there. Uh, and engaging in a, in a debate, in a dialogue, a debate is a wrong word, in a, in a process of communication with different communities, it changes your own perception and understanding all the time, at least it does mine. And we have many other, apart from the struggle we have, many other concerns, interests. The memory is, of course, a key and a core issue for us. We continue to work on how people looking for the remains of the dead, or what was scattered all over Timor, collecting. And, and the processes and ceremonies 
uh, both traditional and Catholic, which surround that. And people value that. There's a, a kind of a, a part of a memory uh, which is symbolic, you know, like a museum. I mean, how many people actually go to the museum? Probably a tiny number in any country. But I bet you the vast majority of them would be very offended if they didn't have a museum. They want there to be a museum. The museum is part of showing that we have a history and we have a story. Uh, even if you never go there in your entire life, you definitely want it there. So it's important that it should look good. It's important that it should be there. It's like a monument in itself. And, and uh, that process, we work with. We, we, I mean, I, I talk at the museum a fair bit. I, I, you know, I work with them. Um, but most of what we do is not there. Most of what we do is in the communities or, uh, you know, on the editing table. We work with the French a lot because the French National Archive supported us uh, from 2005. And they were the ones who proposed us for registration by UNESCO in their, in their non-physical uh, main program, which is called the Memory of the World. So we are a kind of heirs rock, if you like, at least a non-physical one. <laughs> and that, that in itself is a part of valuing something. I don't know how many people are going to look at the 450 hours we have in the French National Archive, even if they could. But the fact that it's there, is important not just to Timor, it's important to UNESCO, apparently, you know, to, to people around the world. Um, the EU contribution of people in, in New Zealand and Australia, around the world, in the process, is part of that story, is one of the reasons why they registered it. Because the, the story that they were registering was something on the cusp of a change in the relationship between news and the public. The story of Timor Leste is probably the first case of a country achieving its independence through audiovisual means, actually. And, and why, how did these small number of guerrilla fighters that I met in the mountains manage to make their voice heard? They built museums where I met with them in East Timor. I didn't. Nobody they did it on their own initiative. Miles from the nearest road, there's a museum right now built where I met with the guerrillas in the mountains in 1990 because the people there, the communities, never watch TV, at least not that sort of TV, see it as the breaking of the circle of silence that was around. And what was that circle? It was the thing that stopped them in communicating with people like yourselves, people outside, who shared their values. And through that shared statement and demonstration of values, people around, small groups of people around the whole world were able to create a movement. And that movement, was able to eventually overturn the diplomatic, so-called strategic, interest-based alliances, which had conducted and signed East Timor to the disposable bin. And by humanizing that bin, where these people were consigned to, Suddenly, not suddenly, but over a process of time, with the cooperation of people, active people, engaged people all over the place, the story changed. And the story with the story changed the, the reality of politics. And the cynical declarations of people like the Australian ambassador in Jakarta in 75, they talked about it being sad but real politics that they have to consign East Timor to the dust. Um, because that's what everybody else does, was exposed as not only immoral and lacking in the basic values which most Australians have wished to claim as the basis for their story, but also not real politic, real politic at all. Very unreal politic because he lost. And that to me is the story that, 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 that is unique about Timor and tells a story much bigger than Timor itself. That ability for a group of people in extreme situation to communicate through their humanity to people around the world and through that to transform the struggle. Timor didn't win with guns even though they kept on to the end of a few of them. It won by 
communication by, by extremely skillful use of the story. Just to thank the Max for a um, memorable, yeah. funny long term presentation. And uh, thank you very much. If you if you wish to have uh, any further discourse with him, I'm sure he's ready and willing for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.